Oh, look at this. Look at this, Tomas. Look at what we got here. We got another fan poll coming in for another fan polled pay-per-view. Taboo Tuesday, as Adam Copeland would say. Welcome back, everybody, to the ZNT Wrestling Show. I am the Cody Crybaby known as Zach, who's never said a bad thing about my favorite wrestler, The Rock, on my Twitter. He is Tomas, the CM Punk fan who's never said a damn bad thing about CM Punk on one of these podcasts ever. Oh, right? I love CM Punk. I yeah. love his promo on Monday Night Raw. <laughs> he is my favorite wrestler. <laughs> no. Stay tuned to After WrestleMania when I get that Hell Froze Over shirt. Stop gaslighting everybody, dude. <laughs> Stop gaslighting me. <laughs> but, yeah. Uh, I, no. won't, I, I won't eat crow, but I have a can of Tiki Punch. I don't know if that counts. No, no, it doesn't count yet. It does not count. But, yeah, what better way to uh, get ready for WrestleMania season than by talking about a fall pay-per-view from 2005? Mm-hmm. That's how so this retro worry. works. That's how this retro works, though. Don't worry, ladies and gentlemen, you will be WrestleMania fixed. We've been talking about a classic WrestleMania to review, and I think we know which one we want to do. We'll give you a small hint. It is the 40th anniversary of WrestleMania, and the best things end in zero. So we'll leave you with that. We won't mm -hmm. leave you with that. But we are talking about Taboo Tuesday today. It's the ongoing, never-ending retrospective we have. For some reason, there were two pay-per-views in October. That's why we had a knockout. Two pay-per-views this month, and see, we were we were reviewed last year's Taboo Tuesday around this time, and it wasn't the best show, and I can't no. help but feel the same about this show, and I think I know what makes this pay-per-view so erratic in a way. Two things. Number one, there were a lot of changes to this card. In an already unpredictable pay-per-view, they threw some last-minute changes at us that, like, this is, like, such a mysterious pay-per-view because with a certain match on here we're speculating i didn't know what happened with this match until like last week which is very weird but the other thing i don't like about this pay-per-view is that i don't think the wrestlers were really given much time they were expected a lot on the fly because they didn't know who their opponents were going to be who their what their stipulations were going to be until that of the match so even though we got some really cool ones like Chris Jericho and Shelton Benjamin, other than that, all of this felt very on the fly, mm -hmm. which didn't really, I don't want to say it was sloppy, but it just felt very disjointed. Yeah. Like a lot of these wrestlers were working on the fly in these matches. You have the weakest uh, Hunter versus Michaels match on last year's event. Um, this year, we get John Cena as the head of the table, so to speak, the head of the Raw Chain Gang. There's a triple thread match headlining this card, and there's a fantastic semi-main that we will certainly get to. But this one, like you said, yes, even though you do have a bunch of the fan vote, and a lot of the uh, the wrestlers went in kind of going in and improvising just because they didn't really know who their opponents or the stipulations were going to be, there were still so many freaking cards subject to change moments throughout this. Case in point, your announced team for this card is Jerry the King Lawler, as you would expect. And my personal favorite play-by-play -play guy of all time, Joey Styles. Oh my god! I saw Joey Styles on this thing and I was like, give me give me this guy every week. I love him. This... But where where's JR? Where's JR? You want to get into that? You want to open up so... that can of worms? Yeah, so I'm going to go off what I remember off of television. I don't have the facts right in front of me, but I do remember this era very vividly from my childhood. JR was brought on on screen. You have to help me explain this because he got fired on screen. by Again. Man of all people. Yeah, I think because he was going against Vince or something. It was a very strange, just out of nowhere. We're going to bully the hell out of JR on TV and we're going to we're going to fire him. And their on-screen reason for why he wasn't there is that JR was having cancer. I know JR has battled with, uh, with no, I'm, I'm, not, I'm sorry, not cancer, surgery. He was going to have surgery. I know he's battled with cancer in his life, but I don't know if it has something to do with that. They were making a joke that he was having surgery, uh, testicular surgery. So I don't know what's real and what's not, or if JR like, got fired for real. But I remember he was going to get fired, and then Linda McMahon came out to save him and then Linda fired him and then gave him a low blow on the way out. So we now have the sole announcer from the ECW era coming in and Joey Styles. And he himself is another can of worms. This is going to be a kind of short stint for him. And let's just say it's not going to end well when we get on the other no, side of this. No, no. Hey, 
I I I enjoyed Joey Styles' run on the uh, on the Raw side of things while we had him because he brought so much freaking passion to this. You were hearing terms that you normally didn't hear from a Vince McMahon play by play blah, 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 a play by play guy, if I can speak. Um, Michael Cole certainly was not saying the word wrestling on live pay per view. Joey Styles did though. He was calling people like Edge wrestlers and not superstars. He was calling people like. Chris Masters, you know, he was calling Chris Masters his holds like, you know, like nobody else did. Uh, like, I want to call this out awesome. now. Think Joey Styles didn't pan out well in WWE because he was so used to being a solo commentator that once he finally got put in a booth, he didn't get it well along with others. I mean, it's not like he didn't work well with Jerry Lawler. He worked fine with Mick Foley at the one night stand show that we talked about not too long ago. Um, it's it's and, not you know, like he worked with Don Callis. Yeah, no, and he also had like you know guest commentators come into the ECW booth from time to time. I know Shane Douglas was a color commentator for them for a while, so it's not like he can't work well with others. But his style was just so against what Vince McMahon wanted out of his commentators, so watered down, so centered on storytelling as opposed to actually telling the viewers what's going on in the ring. But, yeah, and also when you, when once you say it, when Joey is forced to say the things that Vince wants him to say, it's very unnatural, and that's mm-hmm. what I know. Joe, uh, yeah, like Joey will just randomly scream about things that he won't scream about, and then when you get to like the ladies' match, match Joey's not the kind of guy to ogle over the women, so it was very odd to hear him say certain things like that. But yeah, that's a new era for uh, the Raw commentary team, but. This opening matchup is very interesting and very, yeah, it, 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 it basically <laughs> embodies the spirit of this pay per view was what WWE wanted and what the fans ultimately wanted. Because here's the thing about Taboo Tuesday, and this is going to become very apparent in like when it turns into Cyber Sunday next year. I feel like they very much they didn't fix the polls, but they would like here's. They would. uh, No, here's the thing. Here's option A. Here's option B. And here's option C. This is the one we want you to pick. Please pick this one. Yeah. So let's get only the second one. So WWE was like, "Hey, we're going to put your option ups here, but we would really appreciate it if you voted for what we have on the writers team." But this was the pay per view where I was like, "Nope." The fans Mm. voted for what they wanted. Yeah, the fans voted for what they wanted, and they surely got what they wanted. So we have an interpromotional tag team invitational, I guess you can say. It is Edge and Chris Masters representing Monday Night Raw going up against two SmackDown superstars of the fans' choice. And your options are as follows, Tomas. Christian Cage, Matt Hardy, Sparkplug, Hardcore Holly, John Bradshaw Layfield, and Rey Mysterio. Now... You look at this field, and you think that one of these picks is a given. Rey Mysterio was voted in, of course, because this pay-per-view was taking place in his hometown of San Diego. So, of course, the fans were going to vote him in. To your point, WWE and their storytelling and their writing team, they really wanted those fans to pick JBL as Rey's partner. Because at No Mercy, we talked about it. JBL was kind of running down the wrong guys in his promo for Pretty much no reason. Um, yeah. JBL, the problem The problem is this, though. JBL is a heel. The fans don't like him. So, basically, what they got was Rey Mysterio in a random tag team with another popular babyface in Matt Hardy, who already ba- basically resolved his problem with Edge. Um, the feud between Matt Hardy and Edge is long over by this point. Matt Hardy has already been banished to the opposite brand. He already lost to Edge in that ladder match at Raw Homecoming. But Matt Hardy gets another chance to get in the ring with Edge and wrestle him for a little bit. Um, yes, and my next question was going to be, you know, how this all came together. Why were Edge and Chris Masters picking a fight with SmackDown in the first place? Can you tell us about that? I have no idea. I think they were yeah. just trying to, like, honestly, to me, it feels like WWE was trying to cash in on the SmackDown versus Raw name. Because this is around November when the video game was coming out. So... They really wanted to capitalize on that publicity, and they centered Survivor Series around the Raw versus SmackDown theme in 2005. I was going to say, we're, we're going to bury the lead real fast here in saying that this is the slow build to what's going to be the Team Raw versus Team SmackDown match. 
at Survivor Series next month. So mm -hmm. I feel like this was a, an appetizer, you want to say. But as you said, uh, Rey Mysterio, the hometown boy, and Matt Hardy, which, of course, he's very popular on SmackDown. He's a very over baby face. And, of course, the fans are going to vote him in so we can get another crack at Edge. So I don't yeah. know what WWE was expecting. They put Matt on the poll. He's more popular than JBL. Of course, he's going to get voted in. So we have the two fan favorites in Mysterio and Hardy versus, you know, Edge and basically his crony, Chris Masters, because it was one month ago where Chris Masters was semi-main eventing Unforgiven against the greatest of all time in Shawn Michaels. And now he's tagging alongside edge and now and he's, he's his own theme song he's the muscle for mr money in the bank now so yeah. what happens next is lita and edge see the results of the poll and edge in storyline basically thinks he's above this and he pulls himself out of the match why it's not advertised they advertise that edge was going to be wrestling and then vince mcmahon pulls a fast one it's a classic vince mcmahon maneuver you advertise for weeks that Edge is going to be wrestling on this show. And they probably knew damn well that Edge probably... I don't know why Edge didn't wrestle on this card. I'll be quite honest with you. Because he wasn't on the Survivor Series card either. But, like... I mean, he, he, has a, he does the cutting edge of Survivor Series, but this was so odd. Yeah, and... he, he must have been injured. Like, there's no good reason why he pulled himself out of this match. Like, in real terms. So Edge, on his way out, introduces his replacement in Snitsky. And this isn't yes. big, badass, hoss Snitsky that punted a baby last year. This is directionless, foot fetish Snitsky. So you have very green, not over Chris Masters, and a very, uh, what would you even say? Like, a, I don't want to say a burnt out, but like, there's no fuel left in that tank in Snitsky over two really over baby faces. And I think that's my biggest issue with this match is that there's zero heat. Yeah, this no heat. House show match. It definitely felt like an opening contest, which did not need two hot tags. I mean, Matt Hardy was going in there. He's a house of fire. He hits a big old side effect on the big 300 pound Snitsky, which is an impressive feat of strength there. Um, Hardy's taking the heat for a while. Rey Mysterio gets this hot tag finally, and the hometown crowd is just going crazy for this guy. Uh, you know, he's just doing all of his greatest hits, running dropkick tornado DDTs. Uh, Chris Masters tries to lock in his master lock on Rey Mysterio, or the full Lashley, whatever you want to call this submission hold. Uh, Rey Mysterio, uh, he kicks off the ropes to break free. So does that mean that Rey is the first person to break free of the master lock? That does not count. That is Why not? Break. No. Yeah. He was talking. Masters meant you can actually not physically break out of it with sheer strength. Wow. And I will back up Masters when it comes to that. All Here's right. I think with this match, I thought it started off very slow in the beginning because the lack of heat. But again, Matt Hardy and Rey Mysterio are just so popular with the crowd by the yeah. second half of this match. They really picked it up. And I'm not saying Snitsky and Masters are bad workers. Like, they went in there, they got their job done, they know how to do, like, the basic heat, they know how to, you know, keep Rey Mysterio down, but again, they don't have enough to, like, the crowd, there's a difference between guys like Masters and Snitsky and Edge, you love to boo Edge, you love to hate Edge, but Snitsky and Masters, they're just your, they're just there, they're your heels. big brutes, yeah, they're two generic heels, like, I don't like them, but I have no reason to really boo them, yeah, like, yeah, they're just, like, Let's say this. If Ray and Matt were not in this match, you could go to the bathroom during this match. You wouldn't miss a damn thing. Yeah, they're basically obstacles for your over baby faces to uh, basically conquer. Uh, <laughs> I just noticed Tomas' uh, custom name was uh, on the screen because he's a CM Punk cuck, and I uh, renamed him. But anyway, um, so basically, Matt Hardy and Ray Mysterio, as random of a team as this is, these two looks like they work together really well. And if they wanted to continue these guys as a tag team, like, it wouldn't have surprised me in the slightest. Like, what should we call this team, anyway? Let's just say, oh, version 619. Thank that? you. Thank you. Yeah, ver version <laughs> um, 619. Yeah, I like that. I had this very, I had a hunch while watching this match. If Eddie didn't pass away, they would have slapped the tag team titles on these guys like that. Yeah, because Ray Ray hits the masterpiece with a 619 and he backs right into a twist of fate. 
Matt Hardy nails the twist of fate. He does like the Scott Hall point to Ray as he's springboarding off the top. Hits Masters with that springboard superfly splash. Gets the three count. Was there ever any doubt? Um, eh, I mean, the match wasn't bad, but like, you could... This is like a passable match on SmackDown, not on pay-per-view. I'll give it two and a half stars because the latter half of the match did get exciting and the fans yeah. really did get into it. I think the fans just had more fun cheering for Ray and Hardy. And I will say, I'm I, I'm not going to call Snitsky and Masters slouches. They really, they held their own in this match. I think mm-hmm. they were, again, you have two veterans in Mysterio and Hardy. And I think they were able to communicate very well with Snitsky and Masters. I do think Snitsky and Masters are reliable workers. I will give them that. So I'll give the match two and a half stars. Again, my I'll match it. with it, th- there was no heat. There was zero heat to this match. If yeah. Edge was in it, there would have been a hell of a lot more heat. If Edge was in it, and if WWE got what they wanted and JBL was in it, all due respect to Matt Hardy, you probably would have had a lot more heat and a lot more opportunities at telling a good story because JBL and Ray just had that barn burner at no mercy not too long ago. So Hero, I will say this. WWE does get their way because they rebooked this match on SmackDown with Mysterio and JBL as partners, but JBL gets like thumped in the eye somehow, and he uses that an excuse to abandon Rey Mysterio. So I think that was going to be the plan finish for this match if WWE got their way. Yeah, yeah, but instead we got a fun house show quality match on pay per view. So in any case, uh, oh no, oh you want to talk about oh. random tag teams? Yeah, let's talk about this very random Sunday night heat feud. I want to talk, <laughs> this is actually a very good segue into this, what I want to talk about. <laughs> Raw Christ. after Unforgiven. I want to say a week after Unforgiven, after Homecoming, I attended my very first Monday Night Raw. And that was very exciting. Me, my brother, and my dad, we, uh, we got all merched up. We got our sign. This was our first televised event. We knew Kane was going to return. And we, this was your first show. You never forget your first show, your first Monday Night Raw. And it was so cool to see how they actually do it on television. And then um, one of my first memories was um, right when Monday Night Raw started. This is before I knew Sunday Night Heat. They, they taped it. So we watched Sunday Night Heat, and I'll get back to Heat. Uh, right at the beginning of the show, like they did the opening segment, they started showing the SmackDown rebound. And I turned to my dad and I go, I have to go to the bathroom. And he goes, you had an hour and a half to go, and now you're saying so right when the show started? I go, yeah. He goes, all right, let's go. So I just remember Eddie Guerrero on the Titan Tron talking, and I'm just like, yeah, I'm embarrassed right now. I had to go pee. <laughs> but we'll revisit more memories of that Raw because that Raw uh, very much set up this pay-per-view. But, yeah. okay, let's talk about Raw Homecoming. Raw returned to USA Network almost 20 years ago. And now in 20, 20 years later, they're going to be on Netflix. I feel fucking old. That's fucking nuts, man. Yeah, I mean, they're not going to be on Netflix until next January, next Royal Rumble season. So oh, we yeah, still got a ways to go. Be 20 years on USA. That is crazy. Yeah. No, that's wild, dude. So they held this big Monday Night Raw to celebrate Raw coming back to USA. And on that show, um, they had this big, like, gathering of the legends. There was a lot of, like, you know, your Jimmy Snookas, your Kamalas, your your uh, Roddy Roddy Pipers, your your Greg Valentines, all those guys were doing, Sergeant Slaughter was there, and they were interrupted by one, Rob Conway. Just Rob look Conway. at me. <laughs> Rob Conway has basically <laughs> been turned into a discount Dollar Tree Rick Rude. He Ain't I insane to see? <laughs> he comes out with sunglasses, he has his face on his trunks, and I, I hated this gimmick so much. This was one of the worst gimmicks of this era. I hated the theme song even more. And Joey Styles was actually taking the time on commentary to ridicule this guy. He was like, is that his face on his ass? Is he wearing his face on his trunks? He is. He's wearing his face on his trunks. I, I couldn't help but watch this during his his, uh, his entrance that he's just a Dollar Tree Rick Rude. Yeah. You can't, okay, here's the thing. You can take all the inspiration from the world from your, you know, your, your legends, your guys you look up to but if you just straight up take a gimmick and slap it on a guy that can't do the gimmick as well as the original it's it, it's pointless and that's why this was a pointless rip off dollar tree version of rick Rude. 
I can only imagine Tomas in a grocery store now, um, <laughs> and he sees uh, he sees an action figure of Rick Rude hanging on the shelf, and he's like, Mommy, I want Rick Rude! And she's like, no, you got Rick Rude at home, and it's Rob Conway action figure. <laughs> so Rob Conway makes his, ring, his way to the ring with these legends, and he basically disrespects them, so now he has to run the gauntlet and fight all these legends, mainly on Sunday Night Heat. And when I was there, he wrestled Greg the Hammer Valentine yeah what the fuck yeah that's <laughs> a random ass match <laughs> 10 years old and i'm watching greg valentine wrestle what the fuck yeah so he's also picking a fight with eugene because eugene you know he loves all the legends he imitates all the legends so basically it was going to be a two-on-one handicap match where you got to vote in the legend to team with eugene to fight rob conway let's get this part out of the way rob conway makes his out to the ring with tomco because he complained to Eric Bischoff, and Bischoff said, okay, we're going to make this a tag team match. Tomko's meal ticket, Christian Cage, is on his way out of the fucking company. Yep. So oh, which we forgot to mention. Christian Cage was part of the poll, and that is the last image that you see of Christian on WWE television and WWE pay-per-view for four years. Because about two weeks after this event, Christian Cage is the big surprise debut at TNA's Genesis pay-per-view. And he would go on to do great things with impact he would go on to win the nwa world heavyweight title not even three months after this so he safe to say he made the right choice time. yeah so if you want us to review some tna pay-per-views we can continue talking about christian cage but unfortunately this is the end for christian he's a guy that i watched as a kid growing up so it was very weird to see him leave anywho so tom Coe's on an island all by himself he is a charisma vacuum so he's got yeah. nothing to do I think this is the last time we're going to talk about Tomko. Thank God. Um, yeah. So it, it's Conway and Tomko versus Eugene, and your choices are Kamala, Rowdy Roddy Piper, and Jimmy Superfly Snuka. No, 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 no. It wasn't Roddy Piper. It was. Oh! oh I wish it was Roddy Piper. <laughs> what? I fucking wish it was Roddy Piper. What do you mean you no, wish it was Piper? <laughs> what? You, you got what? Okay. Fine. Hacksaw Jim Duggan. Okay, let's talk about Hacksaw Jim Duggan for a second. He's here, but he's going to be wrestling regularly for WWE for yeah, the next two years. Sporadically, yeah. He often makes surprise appearances in the Royal Rumble because he was the very first winner of a Royal Rumble match, and they hammer that point home on commentary. Hey, remember this guy? He won the first Royal Rumble, <laughs> and then he's tossed when out like a, two minutes later. When it was a 20-minute, <clears throat> when it was a 20-man Royal Rumble, and the winner didn't even get a title shot. Right. So irrelevant. But yeah, Hacksaw <laughs> Duggan, you're going to see him for a while. He's going to be wrestling. Why can't I say that word? Wrestling regularly on Raw for the next three years. It is very fucking strange. But yeah, Duggan, Kamala, and Snuka. Hey, hey, out of those legends, I, I, I wish Piper was in this poll. I oh, yeah. I wish Piper was in this poll because nothing against Kamala, but why do they keep bringing this guy back? For a He's joke. He's known for one thing and one thing only, and that's feuding with The Undertaker. And being back afraid of the casket. Yeah, what was that back in 91? 92, I think. Where's Greg when you need him? You can right? <laughs> all day long. I and... want I want to say Kamala and Taker fought at the 92 SummerSlam in Wembley as the semi-main. I want to say that, but I could be wrong. Yeah. And then Snuka, everything regarding Snuka, like take the, the murdering thing out for a second. Well, he is old. He was 62 years old at the time of this pay-per-view. Holy shit, why is he still working? I don't I don't know. I mean, I knew he killed it in the 80s, but like, you know, I knew this tag team would kill it. That's probably why the uh the fans voted him in. Snuka is voted in. It's Eugene and Snuka versus Conway and Tomko, and I don't know what you want me to say about this match. It was It was absolutely it, nothing. If the opener was a regular SmackDown match, this was a Sunday Night Heat match. There was really nothing to this match. And it goes yeah. on for Six minutes. Yeah, Eugene nails a rock bottom on discount Rick Rude. Jimmy Snuka climbs to the top rope and probably gets confused because he sees Rick Rude lying down on the mat, and he's like, you've been dead for six years, Bubba. He jumps off the top rope. He hits a superfly splash on Rob Conway, gets the three count, half a star. That's the best I can give it. <laughs> That's the Listen. best I can give it. Listen, Conway sucks. Tom yeah. sucks. But here's the thing. You have this brand new heel gimmick. You have this big brute in Tomco. What favors are you doing to them by humiliating them by a 60-year-old man 
and Eugene, who's not popular anymore. Not doing them any favors whatsoever, are you? No. <laughs> but so then after the match, Tomko tries to uh, get some revenge, but out come Kamala and Hacksaw Jim Duggan to basically, not even the odds, but beat down the heel four on one. And Eugene is celebrating with all the legends that were on the pole. And well, I think yeah, they all wasted their time coming to the arena and Kamala got fully gimmicked up. Give him something to do at least. Yeah, I think I think this is the end of uh, the Rob Conway legend killer gimmick. It's like what Randy Orton was doing in 03, but like 60 times less cool. You yeah. know? <laughs> if this disappointed you guys, I'm sorry. Wait <clears throat> seven years, Keith Slater's going to do this gimmick again, but it's way more entertaining. Oh, yeah. Oh, I mean, yeah. Hell, I go Sid comes out and fights Heath Slater. It is really freaking cool. And Which plus, is he- nuts. It's nuts, like, thinking about that. Because, like, uh, after the gruesome leg injury that Sid had in 2001, never would have thought he would have wrestled again, even for a couple minutes. But then he goes out there, squashes Heath Slater with a power bomb, and I'm like, that was fun. That was a lot I mean, of fun, you know? Well, you take that into consideration, Heath is a million times more entertaining than Rob Conway would ever be. Yeah, so, and he only uh, he only uh, he only has half the brains that you do. Uh, exactly. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, fine, half a star. I didn't care about this match. I didn't care about this match. This was yeah. a nothing match. Very, very nothing match. But up next, you want to talk more about legends? Yes. <laughs> you want to get to another legend versus legend killer sure. contest? You know what it this is... show made me realize? What's that? The talent pool was slim pickings in two thousand five. Either that or they had a lot of injuries on the Raw side. But in any regard, you have Mick Foley going one-on-one with Carlito. And basically, you know, this was all set up on Carlito's cabana where Carlito is disrespecting Mick Foley. Um, I'll, I'll get to that. I'll get to it. I'll get to it. No, no, but... no. Let me say real quick. I was there for that. Oh, you oh, you were there for the cabana? Yes, I oh, was. Oh, that's fun. That, yes, that's I a was. lot of fun. Yeah, really cool seeing Foley. Yeah, so you you saw Foley even way before we saw him at that indie show last year. Like, that was the first time I'd ever seen Foley live. And he was like, I don't know, not even six feet away from us when he came out. Yep. Yeah, that was a lot yep. of fun. But anyway, um, so Carlito, it's your basic setup, basic disrespecting the legend. And Mick Foley's coming out of retirement. What did the fans vote on, though? They vote on which persona gets to take Carlito on. Is it going to be Cactus Jack? Is it going to be Dude Love? Or is it going to be Mankind? This honestly was, it could have been the biggest toss-up of the evening because you could have picked any one of those three and I would have been satisfied with what we got here. A couple things I want to talk about. Number one, I remember I was there because I'll never forget that ending line by Foley. Well, Carlito, you like to say that you're cool. Well, I say that you're a horse's ass. Yeah. (laughs) I like to, yeah. And each one of the Foley personas actually gets on the Tron and they run down what they're going to do to Carlito at Taboo oh, I Tuesday. Loved that. I and loved that. I loved Mankind like reading out of a Dr. Seuss book and doing a nursery rhyme about what he was going to do to Carlito. I'm going to make you bleed <laughs> At the end, you'll leave skin marks in your Speedo. <laughs> that was great. But here's the Fucking thing. love here's McFoley. I get. So, me too. These are all different personalities, different gimmicks of Foley. So, Very. first of all, I voted for Cactus Jack because I wanted to see some hardcore stuff. Um, but Mankind gets voted into the polls. So let me ask you something. You think Foley is just standing around backstage and he goes, oh, I have to be mind- Mankind? Give me one second. Yeah. Yeah, that's why they, uh, that's why they played oh, the video. Everyone. That's why they played the video package after they gave us the results of the poll because they had to give Mick time to change. <laughs> no, well, not even that. I'm talking like personality wise. Isn't that a little disturbing? He just a little bit. Goes, oh, okay. Oh, I'm mankind. All right, give me a second. <laughs> See, he's like sh- like polyjuice potion into whatever uh, <laughs> whatever fucking. Uh... Oh, I'd love to see that transformation. I'd love to see how the 1998 Royal Rumble works with him backstage. But anyway, um, Tomas, are you going to eat some crow right now? Because this is actually a pretty good match. This is a pretty fun match, but it doesn't change the fact that overall Carlito is mid. He's not fucking mid. Shut up. He is mid. No, he is mid. no. He, is mid. He, he, is he was mid. able to carry Mick Foley to a very good match here. Uh, Mick Foley was, how old was he around this point? He was, he was only 40? God. Like, I didn't realize he retired so young. Oh, you know what's funny? Back in 2005, 40 was considered washed out and old, and Foley's just coming in. 
you know, as a nostalgia act. Nowadays, AJ Styles, Lashley, LA Knight, Randy Orton, all, all these guys are in their 40s, and they could go easily for another 10 years. Well, now we have a we have a 50 year old final boss main eventing WrestleMania Saturday in a tag match. So, um, what about that? Yeah, how crazy is that? That's how nuts. A lot of stars are like in their 40s right now, and they could easily go another 10 years. Side but- side note: I read this on Twitter, and it blew my fucking mind. The Rock is now two years older than Hulk Hogan was when Hogan faced him at WrestleMania 18. Wow. <laughs> what I have to say to the Rock about that? Look at this. Look at you now. Look, at you now. look at you now, Mama Rose. Now. This is what now. happens when you fuck with the final boss. <laughs> Mama Rose, look at your son now. Look at you now. Well, look at Chicago, this. Look at your hero now. We're excited for WrestleMania. We will get to that next weekend. <laughs> yes, yeah. Uh, Mankind and Carlito do a lot of uh, crowd brawling in this match. Uh, Mick Foley takes a sick-looking bump, which has him going head first into the steel steps, the back of his head. Oh. Fuck. <laughs> you wonder why this guy retired at 35. Like, yeah. I will say though, and again, I'm giving Carlito his credit here. In the beginning of this match, he had a lot of crisp offense against Mankind. He, he did. A very nice drop kick. They have a very nice exchange. I think these guys they, they did well against each other. One and of the best drop kicks in the business. And debatable. Uh, Fuck you. Again, like, <laughs> it's crazy. Carlito is basically working with all of these legends that are giving him all the advice in the world. But I'm going to bury the lead a little. Why isn't Carlito beating any of these guys? I don't... Yeah. No. They never gave Carlito the big win that I feel like he deserved. And you said the wrong guy went over. Mankind went over Carlito in this match. Um, Carlito does get a nice flurry of offense in. A nice electric chair drop, which... When you perform it on Mick Foley and you're like 50, 60 pounds smaller than Mick Foley, that's very impressive. Um, Foley makes his comeback, hits a double arm DDT. Mankind then pulls out Mr. Sacco, who has a Carlito Afro on. <laughs> on this is a show. Yeah, probably. He sticks it Afro first into uh, Carlito's jugular, and Carlito passes out. And Joey Styles on commentary is elated that his friend got the win. He got him! He got him! And I'm like, Jesus. So it's just Mankind versus Carlito. I know. And they went seven minutes. <laughs> here's my issue with this match. Foley, who has made a career of being the most lovable underdog, the most, you know, like, endearing underdog loser in the history of WWE. Yep. What does Mankind benefit from beating Carlito? None, it's nothing. It's been a given. If you're trying to catapult Carlito to the next level because he is very much in the main event scene in the second half of 2005, going into 2006, Carlito can't beat Foley? You can't put I mean, that win under his belt? I don't know if like Vince wanted to make Mick Foley look like, you know, I don't know if he wanted to just give Mick Foley a win, but if you wanted to book it right and you wanted to give Carlito that big win on pay-per-view... You could just have him fluke pin Mankind if you wanted to. Like, roll up, feet on the ropes, and then Carlito wins. You know, like, it doesn't have to be, like, a super crisp, clean, oh, Carlito just killed Mick Foley. No. You could just have him do the fluke pin, and then you could have the mandible claw bit after the bell. You know, you know? It, it, it honestly makes me feel like, did they even did they even respect Carlito's place on the card? Because I'm thinking about other matches Foley has. Like, imagine if Foley beat Edge at WrestleMania. That wouldn't make sense. No. What if, because I just watched this video on the Rhodes family, what if Dusty beat Randy Orton at the Great American Bash? That wouldn't make any sense. No. I feel like Foley's position here was to take the L for Carlito. And that's my yeah. biggest issue with this match. But I will give the match three stars. Because yeah, was- this was a very fun match. Uh, three stars. It could have been higher if they got like a few more minutes, if they had gone 10 instead of seven. But yeah, it was good. It was good. I enjoyed it. Yeah, very, uh, very fun match. And the crowd was certainly into it. But now we get down to business here. Um, This is where the results of the poll are revealed, uh, as Todd Grisham says, for the main event. Like, he always said it that way, and I loved it. I loved it. I don't know why as a kid, but that main event delivery in my head, like, it it just lives rent-free there. Lives rent-free. Todd Grisham, which we will get into later in the show. Todd Pissum, but anyway. um, Here we have... um, John Cena versus Kurt Angle versus a third opponent in a triple threat match in our main event. And your choices for that third slot are the Big Show, 
the returning Kane and Shawn Michaels. Gee, I wonder which opponent will give you the best match possible. It's I the- love this so much because it's funny because they show Big Show, Kane, and then they pan down to Shawn Michaels, and Michaels is like, hmm, where you can pick me? <laughs> and he's like, Shawn he's Michaels. looking, he's looking up at both giants, and he's like, oh. <laughs> Sean is so I funny, mean, dude. Yeah, Shawn Michaels does get voted in, which, you know, on paper, it looks like a very fantastic main event that we're about to head into. Um, Kane just mean bugs Shawn Michaels the entire time. But Big Show, being the big giant gentleman he is, extends the hand for the handshake, probably breaks Shawn Michaels' hand in, in the process. But just like last year, since Big Show and Kane did not get voted into the match, they will now be facing Lance Kane and Trevor Murdoch for the World Tag Team titles. That is yes. upcoming out as a kid i didn't realize how lopsided this was but oh yeah kate and murdoch just won the tag team titles a month ago and now you're putting them in the ring with big show and kane yep. how do you think this is gonna turn out oh not good not good for uh a guy who looks like david von eric yellow rose of texas and uh i i, I don't know what trevor murdoch looks like he always <laughs> he looks like it's uh like something in the room smells <laughs> like he always he has that like, resting expression like something in the room stinks he you know? looks like his father was a racist i mean i'm not gonna imply anything there but uh I, like the match was the match was okay i mean it just felt like you know the two giants were dominant and big show did the shh gimmick out to the crowd and like his chops on lance cade and trevor murdoch were just gnarly credit to the heels for uh trying to beg off as constantly as they were because they realized they were in there with two giants and uh <laughs> trevor murdoch was like no let's talk about this let's talk about yeah, this you know murdoch was funny in this beginning like the first run that they had murdoch was hilarious but that's the thing about this pay-per-view would you advertise this match if it wasn't a fan poll thing would you advertise this match and build to it to a pay-per-view this no. is a raw match it's it's very much a raw match. Um, Kane and Murdoch do a high low double team move on Kane, which Joey Styles calls the sweet and sour. Um, I don't know why it's called the sweet and sour. I don't know if it's because uh, they like barbecue, but um, rednecks and they like barbecue ribs. And yeah, that's sweet barbecue sauce. Sweet and uh, sour is their favorite. Uh, is their favorite barbecue sauce, and Jr's barbecue sauce always has the sweet and sour taste, but. No, I was very bored watching this match because... Yeah, we're just talking nonsense here. Uh, There was no heat to a lot of these matches. No, Lance Cade is in there all alone against the two Giants, and Big Show and Kane obliterate him with a double-team chokeslam. Big Show pins Lance Cade. It went eight minutes, and you have new World Tag Team Champions and Big Show and Kane. Get used to us saying Big Show and Kane World Tag Team Champions because they would hold on to these titles for a good while. A good while. I mean, there's nothing else to do with them. And when I saw that team, I'm like, this makes sense. Which is, is weird. It's weird you say that because Kane, didn't Kane just return? And they were doing all these vignettes of him saying, I'm back. And I know? was there for his return. I was mm-hmm. there for his return. He was in a battle royal to determine the third participant for this. And they went the whole show without bringing him up. And then right before the battle royal starts, Eric Bischoff comes out and he says, oh, and one more thing. I would like to introduce the return of Kane. If you have never been in attendance for Kane's pyro, that is the loudest thing you are ever going to hear in your life. Oh, yeah. And oh, my God. Not only did my eardrums bleed, but it was hot. We were sitting like upper midsection and you could feel that heat from all the way on the outside of the arena. They did not fuck around with Kane's pyro. Well, I would hope so, because Kane's gimmick is fire, and you gotta make it feel like you're in a burning building whenever he comes in. So, so after the match, they get interviewed um, about winning the tag team titles, but Murdoch is up on the apron, and he is just, like, going crazy. He's mad that they lost the titles. So Big Show says, hold on for one second, and they double choke slam Murdoch, and they walk off holding hands into the sunset as your new world tag team champions. Yep. <clears throat> holding I'm hands. I'm going to let I'm going to let you introduce this next match, but I need to talk about the build. Oh, part if we God. Just say the match, it's not going to make any freaking sense. So but I have done my research and I'm going to try and explain this 
in the best way possible. Let me uh, hold up, hold up, hold up. Let, let, let me uh, let, let me pull the Joey Styles impression and let me just introduce the match uh, in the Joey Styles way, folks. We got a barn burner here tonight. It's a Raw exclusive event, and we got a battle of the beauties. First off, we got the world heavyweight champion. It's the innovator of violence, Dave Batista. Taking on, wait, the the undefeated human suplex machine, Jonathan Coachman, who's been screwing with my cards? What show am I watching? What the hell are we talking about? Let me try to explain it in the best way possible. <sighs> Remember how we were talking about JR? How we got? Fucked? Yep. So, the very next week on Raw, I know you're gonna hear this and be like. How, what, what does this have to do with me? Stone Cold Steve Austin comes out to the defense of, of JR and he wants to win his job back. Um, I was also at the Raw where Stephanie McMahon came out in the Stone Cold truck to fuck with us. But Stone Cold came out to defend JR and he wanted to win JR's job back. The guy who had taken JR's place was Jonathan Coachman. So Bischoff put Austin in a match with Coach at Taboo Tuesday and if Stone Cold won, he would win JR's job back. Let's fast forward to the Raw before Taboo Tuesday. Coach is out there. He's running down Austin. And he, oh, uh, who, who did uh, Coach wrestle? Uh, Funaki. Funaki, Funaki. So Bischoff brings out Funaki because Coach is the number one announcer on Raw. So it's only appropriate that he faces number one, number one uh, J- uh, announcer on SmackDown. I think it was Vince. I think it was Vince that brought Funaki out. Okay, okay. So Funaki comes out, and then all of a sudden, Goldust comes out. Okay, so Goldust helps Coach beat Funaki, and Coach says, oh, Stone Cold, you embarrassed Goldust on an episode of Raw. You dressed him up like a baby. You threw him through a, a porta potty So Goldust wants revenge, and I'm just sitting here thinking, who the hell remembers that? I don't. So, so Vince comes out again, and he says, Okay, I'm going to explain this in kayfabe and then non-kayfabe. So Stone Cold refused to work the match in real life. He thought he was above this match. He thought it was yeah. stupid. I even heard rumors that Coach was going to go over. So yeah. Stone Cold was just like, fuck this. I'm not doing this match. And he just no-showed the event. So in a last-minute ditch effort to kind of scrounge something up, because you don't tell the fans Stone Cold's going to be in the building – and then don't deliver on Stone Cold. Vince comes out and says, Stone Cold was involved in an accident, and but he thinks Coach, he's just afraid of Coach, so Stone Cold will not be on the pay-per-view. So instead, he replaces him with Batista, the world and, heavyweight champion from SmackDown. And if Batista wins, does JR get his job back? They drop that from the storyline completely. What the fuck is going on here? So Batista so, runs hold, out hold, there. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold yeah. On. There's one more thing I forgot to bring up. So of course. Batista goes out there to confront Coach and Goldust, and then Vader comes out. For no reason. <laughs> Vader, Big Van Vader, the Mastodon, out of fucking nowhere, comes out, and, and Goldust and Vader beat down Batista and then they lift him up, and Coach slaps the shit out of Batista. Okay, how the fuck did we go from Stone Cold Steve Austin fighting for JR's job to Coach, Vader, Goldust, and Batista? This feels like if you just press simulate on WWE Universe mode in 2K24 11 straight times, just a whole year, and you see him 11 years into the future. Batista is holding the big gold belt. And Jonathan Coachman, Vader, and Gold Dust are a stable. And Jonathan Coachman has somehow <laughs> become the number one contender. World Heavyweight title's not on the line here. Thank God. But, you know, <laughs> it's so fucking random, dude. Okay, it is I so fucking random. This. They saw Stone Cold was not going to be on the pay-per-view. So they thought, okay, nobody, we, there's no way we can get anybody as over as Stone Cold. No such late notice, but the fans really do like Batista, so we can at least bring him in and somewhat salvage this because Batista was pretty over. And I will give Coach this much credit: he cuts a promo before the match, and he he's really good at getting heat. I'll give Coach that he is a heat magnet, and he says, 
Oh, the slap heard across the world. And you know what? After I embarrassed Batista tonight, we are one step closer from saying your new world heavyweight champion, Jonathan Coachman. And I'm like, you know what? That's a good way to get heat. Because the very thought of Coach as world champion is sickening. Yeah. So this is Taboo Tuesday after all. We still have a fan poll to get to. What could Batista and Coach possibly have uh, to do in this match? They could have a verbal debate. They could have an arm wrestling contest. Or they could have a good old-fashioned Donnie Brook, a street fight. Gee, with 91% of the votes, street fight wins. So of course it does. Yeah, you know, that shouldn't be any shock to anybody. Um, so, let me walk everybody through this match. I, I need to because this is... Okay, so... I don't even know where to begin with this. As a kid, for some reason, I liked this because the thought of my favorite wrestler beating the shit out of these three guys after they embarrassed them was really cool. And you know what? This could have been fun. For what this was, this could have been fun. It could have. This is how the match goes down. Goldust and Vader no-sell Batista's offense for like a minute. They, They just stand there and they corpse while Batista just throws these weak-ass punches at them, throws them out of the ring, and then they Goldust hits Batista with a kendo stick, and Coach whips him with a belt, while I, I'm, I shit you not, Vader stands there and does nothing. He yeah. does absolutely nothing. Goldust so, and Batista, Vader look like shells of what they used to be. Like, yeah, fucking and, hell. So... So Batista pulls Goldust like, no, no, he, he just kicks Goldust off. He kicks Vader off. He gives Goldust and Vader spine busters. Again, Vader has not thrown one punch in this entire match. He stood there and just let Batista do everything to him. They get thrown out of the ring. Uh, Batista whips Coach with the belt, which I will admit was pretty satisfying. Slaps him in the face, gives him a receipt. Batista bomb. Batista wins. You know what, man? I gave this a lot of thoughts. A lot of thought. <laughs> Negative five stars. Wow. Minus Negative five stars. Minus five stars for this match. Why? This was fucking horrible. You sure you sure it wasn't minus four and three quarters, which I gave it? <laughs> this was fucking atrocious. Because at least this Batista whipping been fun. At least Batista whipping coach was satisfying. This could have been fun you could have batista and vader could have gotten you know they could have gotten physical they could have had a couple more weapons they could have you know given us the illusion that batista could have lost this match and batista could have made a comeback he could have beat the shit out of them he could have put somebody through an announce table this could have been fun because you know if austin was in there he would have made that match hella fun to watch yeah but Again, I love Batista. I like seeing Batista here, but he is still very much deer in the headlights when it comes to these things. You have Vader, who he looked like he didn't want to be there. So why yeah. was he there? And I don't want to uh, badmouth Dustin too much, but he this he, he shouldn't have been in this match. So I have, I have a question uh, for you then. Is this the worst match of Batista's career, pay-per-view-wise? What? I mean, yeah. Can can we think of a worse Batista match than this? But, I mean, it's not like this was Batista's fault. Batista was just in there as a like a like an attempt at a reclamation for this feud, you know, to try and get back like you know the heat that this feud had going into it. But it was I, all for naught. You know, it sucked. I I I. It's like, why did Stone Cold come in in the first place if he didn't want to do the match? And again, why why was Vader there? Like he did nothing. I watched I watched the match twice twice just to make sure. Vader does not throw one punch. He does not do anything. He stands there. He lets Batista ram him into the corner a couple of times. It's Goldust that does the heavy lifting. He yeah. hits him with the kendo stick a couple of times. Batista versus Goldust actually would have been a decent enough match. But <laughs> considering the mental health Goldust was in, he should not have been in this scenario. This mm. was fucking horrible. God, could do you remember Vader in 1992 holding up the WCW championship, beating Sting, and he's a fucking monster like that nobody can fucking touch? 
You <laughs> remember that? It is just standing there and letting Batista kick his ass. Yeah. I mean, and another thing I'll give credit, Batista giving him a spine buster was pretty impressive. Yeah. That's why I gave it, I, honestly, it should just be minus four and a half because Batista did put in some effort, I think. Uh, I don't think this was as horrible as Hogan and Warrior at Halloween Havoc because <laughs> at least there were some satisfying spots in this. But yeah, god awful. God awful. A dumpster fire. And mm -hmm. it's honestly a match that I like to pretend didn't happen. It was so bad. I At, at least I like this more than uh, Tomko and Stevie Richards at Unforgiven last year. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair yeah. Enough. So This was so bad, though. It, it was horrible. And I'm done talking. And I'm done talking about it. <laughs> yeah. So let's so let's uh, let's talk about uh, let's talk about the cooldown. The cooldown. Uh, Battle Royal, huh? <laughs> Once again, it is time for the familiar fantasy Divas Battle Royal for the women's title. Um, yeah. Dressed as I don't remember. Oh, oh, I remember. I remember. It was lingerie. Yeah. Yep. Uh, no, no schoolgirl is uh, option this year, sadly. But <laughs> do you want to talk about the real storyline going into this match? Something mm -hmm. that's very interesting to talk about in the next few months. Yes. So it should be noted that even though this is a fulfill your fantasy battle royal, which is still a concept that I cannot wrap my head around, and in a promotion that was anchored by Vince McMahon, it does not age well at all. Fuck that man. He deserves a special place in hell. But um yeah this is actually the very first pay-per-view match of the one and only mickey james mickey james came in and i swear to god i was watching raw live when this happened and i saw mickey james appear in the frame and i was like oh look it's nidia nidia's back <laughs> same same, same. <laughs> i was i'm so fucking embarrassed to admit that but mickey same. james I, looks you know like nidia when you said that i was like no, don't bring it up. Don't bring it up. But you brought it up too. I'm like, yeah. I remember when she did the run in, and I go, is that Nidia? Yeah, yeah. It is Nidia. Well, well I mean, face, I'm like, oh, that's, that's to be fair, I was going on nine years old, so I couldn't really tell the difference. No, <laughs> I couldn't thanks. really tell the difference. But thanks. Mickey James um, basically debuts as the number one super fan of Trish Stratus. Uh, yes, she is obsessed with Trish, like, she has a whole shrine dedicated to her, which is, uh, which is a layer that'll be peeled back, uh, a little bit deeper into the storyline, but, yeah, it's basically, like, just a friendly thing where Trish is kind of letting Mickey tag along for a little bit, uh, out of the good graces of her heart, because Trish is a full-blown babyface at this point, uh, but yeah, Mickey James is in here. Two of Vince's devils are in this match. Uh, Tori Wilson, I believe, was injured. So you had Victoria, you had Candice Michelle, you had Maria Kanellis, who is just a straight-up interviewer at this point, and the late Ashley Massaro. May she rest in peace. Uh, hey, to be fair, if I had to compare this to last year's Battle Royal, at least the women in there were trying to do some, like, actual wrestling stuff. <laughs> like, and props to oh, Stratus and Victoria for actually wearing wrestling boots. Yeah, and wrestling attire. You know, they didn't go, like, they didn't go full, like, they didn't let the fans perv on them one bit. And to you know? all of our younger fans that might be following this <sighs> retrospective, let's say this. If this storyline doesn't make sense to you, Shawn Michaels is actually doing the same thing right now in NXT with Tatum Paxley and Lyra Valkyria. He likes to borrow from the past. So yeah. it's basically that storyline. Yeah. It's... But a little more a little more toned down. Like, yeah. This gets this gets dark <laughs> in the upcoming months. It gets very dark. But um yeah, Ashley is, you know, Ashley Ashley took a man, like it it sucks like, you know, seeing like the hard hits that Ashley would take in there just because she wasn't ready at this stage of her career. Like she wanted to go back down to OBW. But because the diva search happened, and because Ashley was already exposed on television, you know, they couldn't take her off television just to develop her wrestling skills. They had to keep her character going. They found that more important and uh, more important than her health, which fucking sucks. Um, Ashley's elimination was very hard to watch uh, with all the uh, knowledge that we have later. <laughs> I Sorry, I can't help but laugh at the name I gave Tomas, the CM Punk cuck. But anyway... Uh, <laughs> So, Trish and Victoria, like, I mean, 
this is like your standard Divas Battle Royal around this point. Like, you don't have to go over the top rope to be eliminated, mind you. You just have to be knocked out of the ring because Vince does not think that the women can go over the top rope and to the floor. Which Joey didn't know because, like, almost at the end of the match, he goes, oh, wait, uh, uh, actually, uh, you can get thrown through the ropes as long as your feet are touching the floor. I'm like, props to Joey for treating the women, like, you know, correctly. And assuming that was over the top rope. Yeah. 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 He's uh, ever the chivalrous commentator. That's for sure. Uh, which and in 2005 will, is way ahead of schedule. I will give the match this too. The And the finish was very creative. It was. It came down to Trish Stratus, Victoria, and Mickey James. And Victoria, I will give the credit for booking her like the biggest threat in this match. Because she was. So oh, yeah. Victoria and Trish Stratus are brawling. Mickey James gets involved. And Mickey James basically eliminates Victoria and herself to protect Trish Stratus' title. And, and after the match, Trish Stratus kind of looks at it and goes, huh? I win. Yeah, I no, it was win. it was a great sell and a great reaction by Trish at the end because she basically retained her title without having to do anything at the end. So yeah. it's she's realizing that Mickey James for right now is a very valuable asset to have with her. So, so I will give the match this. It actually did a very good job advancing that storyline um, yeah i'll give it i'll give it a star and a half it wasn't it wasn't horrible yeah i'll give it a star maybe star and a quarter i mean yeah you, no no fuck it star and a half i mean yeah these these girls definitely tried hard uh they definitely tried very hard and the story that was advanced uh through this match i mean it's gonna get it's gonna get a lot crazier let's just say that it's just there's just in the feeling out phases of long-term storytelling here um so Stratus interviewed by Todd Grisham at the end. Mickey James interrupts the interview to say that Trish Stratus basically beat everybody else and she's there to uh, gush over her favorite wrestler. And they celebrate up the ramp. And uh, that that about wraps it up for now. Uh, oh, say- I forgot to complain about Todd Grisham. Um, oh, Todd Grisham, fuck him. I wanted to take a cold hose for that man. I wanted to spray him down with ice cold water because when they were deciding to pull on this, he was like, horn dog eyes bulging out of his head and i'm like i really wish i had an ice cold bucket of water that i could stick a hose in and just spray you down no i wish i uh i just wish i had a frozen water bottle that i could chuck at the back of his head shane helm style (laughs) you know (laughs) like and then he would have to take a sharpie and cover up the staples that i would give him on the back but anyway (laughs) uh sorry buff sorry buff but uh (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> anyway, uh, you want to talk about the match of the night now? You ready? Yes, I do. Thank I God. Yeah, these. This. this is Taboo Tuesday 2005, I think, will go down as a two-match show in the record books. And this is the first half of those two matches. Ric Flair is defending the Intercontinental Championship against the returning Triple H. As Tomas likes to say, how did we get here? So Ric well, Flair, Rick Flair and Triple H. Uh, so <laughs> Ric Flair and Triple H have been teaming up since Unforgiven of 2002. Triple H brought Ric Flair out of the rut that he was in. Uh, Ric Flair was managing Triple H for all this time. Evolution was born. Evolution had since disintegrated by WrestleMania 21. Triple H took his ball and he went home to uh, go have his first kid with Stephanie. Uh, <laughs> in kayfabe, he was also dealing with some injuries there after the Hell in a Cell. Triple H returns as Ric Flair's mystery partner on the Raw Homecoming show against Carlito and Chris Masters. Hunter and Flair beat Carlito and Masters, and then Triple H brutalizes Ric Flair after the match. And Hunter's reasoning behind this is basically... Look at what Ric Flair has become. I pulled him up out of mediocrity, and as soon as I turn my back, as soon as I leave Monday Night Raw, Ric Flair jumps right back down the ladder. So all that work I put into elevating Ric Flair back up to where he belongs was all for nothing. So Let me get this straight. Ric Flair getting treated like a dog for the past three years, doing Triple H's dirty work, basically being a professional kiss-ass to him, yep. is good. But him winning the Intercontinental title is bad. Yeah, yeah. Triple H thinks that the Intercontinental Championship is beneath Ric Flair, yet Triple H is challenging for the Intercontinental Championship, 
which honestly makes the IC title feel as important as it ever has <laughs> in this whole retro so, so far. So before I get to that point, um, Triple H, yeah, that promo was fantastic. I love that. And the episode of Raw I was at was Ric Flair's rebuttal, where Flair came out. He is so fired up. He wants Triple H to come out. And let me remind everybody that Triple H is my brother's favorite wrestler of all time. So he was uh. so hyped for him. Triple H only made it halfway down the ramp until Flair attacked him on the ramp and fought him out to the outside area. So my poor brother, he only got to see Triple H for like 30 seconds. Oh, hey, <laughs> how, how good is it to have Triple H back on these retros, man? I've kind of missed him. I've kind of missed talking yeah, about him. We, we got a little break from him. Yeah. yeah. So these are your options for the match. There's going to be a regular match, a submission match, or a steel cage. One fall to a finish. One fall to a finish. That's what I want. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I Obviously, want. Obviously, <laughs> it's a steel cage match. And this is like, because, say, even though this is the beginning of what, the feud, Because why? Work. What? Why did the steel cage match win in kayfabe? Oh, in kayfabe? Yeah. I don't remember. Tell me. Ric Flair begs the fans to pick a steel cage. That's right. Yeah. That is right. Mm -hmm. um, and they did. So, they granted Ric Flair's is, wish. Again, this felt like a WCW blood feud. Again, the cage, this is where feuds go to die, even though this is the beginning of the feud. And this is the only nitpick I have towards this match. So Triple H is making his way to the ring, and Joey Styles brings up, oh, no, 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 the match is about to start. And Joey Styles brings up, the Intercontinental title is on the line, but I'm pretty sure neither of these wrestlers could care less about the Intercontinental title. Okay, yeah, I, that sucks. That, burned me to my very core yeah burned me to my very core and here's my thing i'm a title guy i love titles i love title histories titles being defended on pay-per-views are a big deal to me so don't sit there and say the intercontinental title does not matter because you know what yeah to me it did it did. yeah Hey, hey, uh, all, all the listeners and all the viewers, make sure to write that statement down from Tomas and then hound him in the comments for not buying the Snoop Dogg title. But anyway, <laughs> he's a coward. I, I, he I likes say, a title I, history, but he I, won't I, buy a belt. <laughs> I didn't say I like owning titles. And Snoop Dogg title is not a real title. <laughs> Debatable. Jimmy Fallon has it. But uh, Ric Flair. When was the last time he was relevant? Yikes, easy, <laughs> easy. So uh, Jerry Lawler says that didn't take long because Ric Flair blades almost immediately. Triple H whips Ric Flair head first into the steel mesh and Flair is blading. Uh, yeah. <laughs> How many steel cage matches have you seen where Ric Flair doesn't bleed in it? Like Please zero. Yeah. But here's the thing. This was a match that Joey Styles was like, if this was the only match of the night he called, it would have been perfect. Because if we can't have JR, I think Joey was just a good enough substitute for this match. Because this was that kind of match that needed that high drama storytelling commentary. Yes. And I loved this match. There, are, there is one thing Ric Flair does not get enough credit for. And that's his selling. Because oh, Ric yeah. is actually torturing this man with every single, like, physical contact he makes with Flair's head. Oh, God! Oh, God! Oh, God! Oh, God! Oh, God. Oh, God. Jesus Christ! And I'm like, oh, oh Jesus! Oh. Yeah. You felt Flair's pain in this match. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, Jesus! Oh! Oh! Oh, God! Oh! Shit! <laughs> oh, fuck! Oh! Yeah. I love player selling. He yeah. sold the fuck out of everything in this match. Oh, man. Yeah, Hunter was very dominant throughout the uh, first part of this match. Was there a point, like, I don't remember, but did Hunter, like, take a bit of Flair's blood and, like, rub it across his chest like a badge of honor? Maybe, I don't think he did maybe. that. I might be thinking of Survivor Series when he did that, but um, because that match, that match gets very fucking bloody as well. Stay tuned for probably the end of the month when we talk about that show. But... Uh, Flair. <laughs> so Triple H grabs the grabs a chain from the top of the steel cage. I don't know why it's there. Probably just rigging. But he goes down for like an axe handle or something. Flair gets his foot up, and Hunter's selling in this match. Like you want to talk about Flair selling? Hunter selling was awesome in this because 
Flair gets his foot up, and Hunter acts like, you know, he was just stunned like nobody else. Like, you know, he's just it's on like, his tiptoes. He's like... You you watch that, and you, you kind of think, gee, I wonder who Triple H's just mentor was. I wonder. I wonder. Yeah, no, there's, like, constant running knees to the head. Flair and Triple H channeling their inner Harley race there. Um, just awesome stuff. Like, it... it Honestly, I haven't seen the Ric Flair Harley Race match from 1983 in a while, but this is honestly the closest. And this is going to sound like a huge compliment because it is. But this match right here felt the closest to a modern, like, reimagining of the Ric Flair Harley Race match from back in the early 80s. Because, I mean, who else to, who else to reimagine it but Flair? You know, <laughs> it's... It's crazy. And considering how much of a student of the game Triple H is, you know damn well he went back and watched that match like five or six yes. times in preparation for this match. Yeah, this you know. Was very good. You know I love my stolen finishers also because Hunter locks in the figure four and Flair's doing his, ah, God, ah, ah. <laughs> He's <laughs> selling, selling in his own home. And, I, don't uh, know. I don't know who would be in my top 10 sellers, but Ric Flair would be very high on that list. Yeah. <laughs> uh yeah, Hunter was bleeding at this point and I don't remember how. Did Hunter get rammed into the cage also? Probably. Yeah, no, that that sounds like the that sounds like the logical one. Flair uh starts his comeback with the uh patented bite to the forehead, uh opening up the wound a little bit more. Um Flair also grabs Hunter by the balls. And does the uh, as Joey as Joey Styles on commentary is like, my God, he's scratching the man's balls. It's pay per view, so I could say the word balls. Yes, <laughs> yes, Joey was very adamant about that. Yep. <laughs> Flair then locks on the figure four. Hunter was screaming, "Oh God, ah, oh, ah!" Oh. No, he wasn't screaming like that, but uh, Flair gives Hunter the middle finger, pulls him back to the middle of the cage. Hunter starts grabbing the official, and he's like, please, break this hold! Break this hold! <laughs> and, like, that to me feels like Hunter's submitting. Like, he's telling the referee that he quits, but... Ah, but apparently no, not. the match continues. The match continues. Um, <laughs> Flair squeezes him in the groin. Hunter tries a pedigree. Flair back body drop on the steel chair, which had been introduced around this point. Someone tried to crawl out of the cage, and they brought the chair into the ring. That That's a bit that they love to do in these cage matches. Uh, Flair nails Hunter with the chair to the head, uh, um, and then one more chair shot, one more death blow. Hunter is out cold, and then Flair crawls out of the cage, and he retains his title. Beats Hunter clean inside a steel cage. Four and a quarter stars. I love this match. It was so good. Yeah, I'll match your four and a quarter. This was the match of the night. This was so good. These these two just clicked together so well. And you can tell that they're very good friends behind the scenes. But it's honestly, this is the match to go back and watch. Yeah. Like from this show. Oh, one, yeah. yeah. No, no question and, about it. And you know, it's crazy because I always say the steel cage is where fuse go to die. But this is just the beginning. But this this could have been the blow-off, and I would have been completely happy with it. If this was a one-and-done, oh, this would boy. have been absolutely perfect. It really pains me to say that a Survivor Series, the rematch, the Intercontinental title is not on the line. And that... This is well, it's not. Awesome. It's not, because Hunter has to get his win back, and it's not like Hunter needs the Intercontinental title at this point in his career. He does. He could have won it, and he could have dropped it the next night abroad to somebody else. Yeah, yeah. No, we'll, we'll 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 touch on that at Survivor Series. Stay tuned if you're listening to this podcast. We I'm hoping to have the Survivor Series 05 review up by the end of April, but stay tuned. Stay tuned for that. But we get to our main event, Tomas. It's it's the reason why everybody came to this show in San Diego and the uh, Wales asshole. Uh <laughs> you know, as Greg Morgan calls it. So like we said before, John Cena is defending the WWE Championship versus Kurt Angle and Shawn Michaels. And this is basically because Kurt Angle won the match by disqualification of Unforgiven. He is automatically put into this match, but they wanted to make a triple threat so they could vote on who was going to be in there. It's Michaels. It's Angle. It's Cena. I know I'm going to sound very contradictory, but I love Cena, but one of these things is not like the other. Michaels and Angle just outclass him so much at this point in his career. Yeah, yeah, it, it it's sad to say that, man. It feels like Michaels and Angle had the majority of the workload in this thing, too. 
Like, they were just revisiting some of their old classics, and they never had a fucking rubber match after their Iron Man match went to a draw because Kurt was a coward. Bullshit. It's such bullshit. <laughs> it's such bullshit. We never got a resolution to that feud. Like, <laughs> and I don't like, like, someone, someone ask Kurt Angle that on this podcast, please, because if there was another rubber match between him and Sean, who would have won? He, yeah. His humble ass probably would tell tell us Sean, but, <laughs> you know. No, knowing Kurt Angle, he probably would be like, oh, that, 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 see, if it were up to me, I wanted there to be a rubber match. But Vince McMahon just, just didn't want to do it. But, but uh, Vince McMahon just didn't want to do it, man. I, yeah, just, <laughs> just didn't want to do it, man. And uh, Shawn Michaels, uh, easily one of the one, one of the best wrestlers in this company. <laughs> That's actually pretty good. Yeah, I like that <laughs> Thank <one>. you. Yeah. <laughs> it's a good Kurt Angle impression. too much of Angle's podcast lately. <laughs> Love Kurt Angle. Anyway, uh, Angle's working over Cena pretty early on. Uh, the crowd, the crowd was actually fairly behind Cena in San Diego. There wasn't a whole lot of Cena sucks chance going on. So Cena was obviously at the Raw I was at, and this is the very first time I started noticing Cena haters because there was a group of guys sitting near me that were chanting "Cena sucks," and me, my innocent ten-year-old self, was like, "Cena doesn't suck. Why don't you guys like Cena? He's the good guy." Oh, to be that naive once again. And that's what I say to everybody out there. If you're one of those monsters that's hating on a kid for loving Cody Rhodes, I want you to go back in time to when we were kids and we were being made fun of for liking John Cena. Are you really going to be that guy? No. No. I I mean, I would never be that guy. But because... Yeah, I, I couldn't hate Cody Rhodes if I even tried. For some reason, <laughs> if you some reason don't like Cody Rhodes, that's fine, but let the yeah. kids love him. Well, Tomas, even Tomas at one point hated Cody Rhodes, and he never got on the yeah. kids' uh, bad side no. for, uh, <laughs> for, for liking him in AEW. At one point in all of our lives, we were either a Hulkamaniac or we were a John Cena fan. You really going to ruin it for this generation? No, no, you plus, can't. Cody Rhodes is too over. Everybody likes okay, him too plus, much. Cody Rhodes. Cody Rhodes is cool as fuck, so... <laughs> he is cool as even fuck. His, even, even his goofy odd dog, Pharaoh. <sighs> Don't you dare disrespect Pharaoh like that ever again. But uh, Angle is a fucking human suplex machine in there. He is uh, German suplexing Cena, Germaning Michaels. Ankle lock on Sean. Michaels kicking him away. There's a there's some really good exchanges here. Uh, Kurt Angle and Sean Michaels slam John Cena's stomach first through the Spanish announce table because the Spanish announce table never escapes a pay-per-view unscathed in this era. Oh, no. Like, <laughs> they, uh, <laughs> Hugo and Carlos almost got away with one on this pay-per-view. Almost. They almost got away with one, but nope. Uh, Angle and Michaels, like I said, do a lot of the heavy lifting. They're getting into a chop fest, like heavy strikes in there. Uh... Angle tries to pop back up with an angle slam off the top. Uh, Michaels kicks out of the angle slam. There's some good near falls in here. It, it feels thing, this time. I never understood how Kurt Angle could do that. How he could just spring back to life, run up to the top rope, and deliver an angle slam. Oh, he's he's been doing that for years at this point in the retro. He's been doing that yeah, for years. Just like yeah, oh yeah. I mean, I've seen him do a few times, but just watching it here, I was just like, God damn, what a feat. What a feat Kurt Angle was able to do. It's even more impressive when he does it to Kane at WrestleMania 18, right? That's a great fucking match. But um, Cena, I, yeah, no, belly-to-belly -belly suplex on Sean, and he has a rough landing on the floor over the top rope. Uh, Cena and Kurt get into it for a bit. Uh, Five-knuckle shuffle. Cena goes for the attitude adjustment. Angle uh, counters into the ankle lock, and the crowd is going absolutely ape shit. Some of them actually, at this point, some of them actually do want Cena to tap out because Kurt's too cool to boo. Like, he's too he cool like, to I, boo. I think the finish was actually pretty damn good. So, Angle has the ankle lock on Cena. He's pulling him away. He's pulling him away. And then, finally, he grapevines it on. And he has this son of a bitch on Cena for quite a while. And then, just when you think Cena's going to tap, Shawn Michaels comes out of nowhere with an elbow drop and nails Angle. Perfect. He tunes, yeah, Fucking tunes perfect. up the fan. Nails Kurt Angle with a super kick, like a pitch perfect super kick. Like you heard that shit just bounce off of his jaw. And then Michaels immediately turns around to an attitude adjustment and Cena wins. Cena pins Shawn Michaels, and I have a huge nitpick with this finish. Sean hit Angle with the super kick, right? Yeah. Cena then hits Michaels with the attitude adjustment and he pins him. That's fine. Kurt Angle's the third element in this. He just got super kicked. 
And not even like five seconds after getting hit with Sean's finisher, he tries to go and break up the pinfall. So he just stops selling sweet chin music. Like, it's almost like it he no like, sold sweet chin music. I don't know. Damn good super kicks, too. And here was my thing. Again, I don't mean to dog on Cena too much because I just talked about how much I love him. And this was peak Cena fandom for me. But the attitude adjustment just did not feel like a very impactful finisher. Like, Cena would do this thing where he would just hit it, and then, like, it didn't even look like it hurt, but Cena would always get the win with it. Yeah. Like, I'll, if there's one thing I'm going to give Hulk Hogan credit for, when he hit that leg drop, it was an impactful leg drop. Well, yeah, I just feel like Hogan, Hogan's also 300 pounds, and he's hitting people with his gigantic tree trunk of a leg, so that's pretty devastating. Yeah, and just around this time, the attitude adjustment just felt like a fireman's carry. And it didn't mm -hmm. feel like just impact. So I think that's what just kind of took the oomph out of this finish for me. But Cena retains. He is starting to string up very impressive wins against very big stars. Of course, Shawn Michaels was going to take the pin. He's the guy to do that. They didn't want a pin angle. I'll give the match three and a half stars. I thought it was fun, but not the best triple threat. It felt like one of those instances where it was two one-on-one -on -one matches. And yeah. the triple threat aspect didn't really pick up a lot of the match yeah uh, i want to give it three and three quarters but realistically three and a half sounds about correct mainly because i i i love kurt angle but i still have a bone to pick with him for no selling the sweet chin music at the end of this match and the first 10 minutes i definitely feel like could have been more exciting because when you put this side by side with let's say undertaker angle and rock from vengeance so two that is one of my favorite triple thread matches ever because it was just high octane exciting action the entire time all three guys were in the ring this felt like a very slow paced version of that i guess the final five minutes were excellent but i feel like if you had more consistent action throughout this match could have absolutely rivaled that vengeance so two match but oh, absolutely it did it also hurts because they only knew this match was going to happen like an hour and a half prior yeah, I didn't really give them time to like come up with a strategy. And again, a lot of these matches felt like that because they were very much on the fly. Taboo Tuesday, 2005. Also, it is a terrible idea to have a pay per view on a Tuesday. I know because I watched this one live. It turns into Cyber Sunday next year, thank God. But I'm going to give this pay per view a 5.5 out of 10. Okay. The semi main was excellent, it was the best thing on there. But like I said, a lot of these matches thrown, felt thrown together with no heat. And that Batista coach match, man, I can't get over how horrible yeah. that Yeah, I think I'm going to match 5.5. I was debating 6 for a while just because I love that cage match so much. But this undercard is just so topsy-turvy and all over the place. You do have a fun Mick Foley and Carlito match, which is a kind of a hidden gem if you think about it. But... Um, the, those two last matches on this show are well worth the price of admission. Joey Styles' commentary is worth the price of admission. Uh, but this is definitely one of 2005's weaker efforts, in my opinion. And we got two more to go. We got two more to go this year with Survivor Series and Armageddon. Uh, some of you have been requesting that we talk about uh, like a career retrospective looking back on the life and uh, times of Eddie Guerrero. Um, Tomas and I have talked about it, and... I kind of want to do it mainly because, you know, Eddie was the first big wrestler death that affected me to my core. And it's still one of those things that haunts me still to this yeah, day. We could definitely uh, what we want to do is we want to go back and kind of like look at Eddie's highlights, not only when we were watching his kid, but like some of his WCW stuff, some of his early <laughs> WWF stuff. We want to talk about how the death impacted us as fans. And then we definitely want to talk about how his death kind of impacted the product for a while. It yeah. really just took the whole product into a different timeline because there's definitely been what if Eddie never died, especially for the next six months of television, how different the landscape would have been if Eddie was still there. Oh, yeah, for sure. So look forward to that. Uh, WrestleMania 40 is on the horizon. I cannot wait to see Cody finally finish the fucking story. Uh, <laughs> fuck you. Fuck you. He's going to finish the story there. Uh, Drew McIntyre is probably going to finish his story. Uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. 
Uh, Unless hit that CM t- Cuck ruins the party for him. Yeah, CM Cuck is going to be on commentary for that match. Uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like it's not him being the referee, but it, it'll probably turn out like to be a finish where he has to referee. Uh, but we'll see. We'll see. Hit that subscribe button if you're new. If you want to keep up with all things wrestling over here, hit that thumbs up as well. If you had fun listening and watching this, if you wanted to uh, check out the video version. But yeah, thanks guys. Stay tuned for the next one.